We will be starting here shortly. If you would like to give public comment on today's agenda, please fill out the public comment form up front and return it to me. Thank you. Madam Chair, it is now 5.32. If you are ready to call the meeting to order. Mimi Fuji Strickler. Thank you. Hal Taylor. Here. Stacy Shin. Not present at this time. David Titzel. Here. Audrey Keller. Patrick Fisher. Here. Roman Schomburg. Not present at this time. Stan Dowdy. Donna Keats. Not present at this time. And Pierce Donovan. Madam Chair, you have a quorum of the War II Neighborhood Advisory Board. So we have 17 participants so far, or attendees. Can we can that back a little bit? Anybody on Zoom wishing to speak with, with public comment, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on reno.gov forward slash meetings. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash links dot reno dot gov forward slash four eight U Z N K R. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the NAB's agenda. The NAB may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay. We also have registered public comment this evening. And our first public commenter will be Rivka Strong. Rivka Strong. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to ask you to please move the mic closer to Mimi because I'm having a hard time hearing her. Move the mic closer to who? Rivka? Mm -hmm. Closer to Mimi? The head of the meeting? Is that better, Ms. Yes. Please provide your... And please provide your public comment at this time. That's, that's all I had. I just couldn't hear what was going on in the meeting. Thank you. Not via Zoom, but we do have public comment for Steve. And Steve, if you could uh, state your last name as well. Thank you. Regarding all the different proposals that have been made 
to uh, build, uh, uh, take over the site and redo it so that it's uh, part of our community. So what I wanted to bring forward was to say that we built that property rather than my family and I in the 70s. And uh, yes, we went through a lot of transitions, even amongst our own family because of uh, deaths, uh, divorces, and whatever, but it ended up being uh, owned by my brother Nate. Uh, and I was a manager here for, for a long, long time, seven, eight, ten, ten years. And uh, we knew what made it work, and, and it was a beautiful place. It was a part of the community. It had so many, I have a photo here of um, what it was like. This is a picture from 19, uh, 1980, which I'll be happy to Yeah, if anyone wants to see it. And it was it was a great spot, tennis, swimming, and whatever. And after I left, we were having we did, we did have difficulty financially, and it was caused by the fact that we we built this property. Um, the MGM was going to uh, be built, and all of a sudden, everybody in the world was going to build apartments in, in Reno. The whole place filled up with apartments and gave us a tremendous amount of competition, and we could not compete. Had to borrow lots of money to with our lender for the one project. And uh, uh, we, we struggled to make it, we couldn't get the rent to find it. But the tennis club parties of it helped sustain the place because all the memberships and the additional revenue which came in definitely you know, we, we, were, we were booming again. People loved it. And so, what I would want to emphasize to our new, to new owners. That's to take into consideration the fact that it's it's had a history, the site's had a history, it's been um, uh, it's a part of the community, it has uh, oriented to be both part of housing and recreation for the community. But they can somehow figure out a way to meld those together so they can maintain that same feeling that we had back because it was a wonderful place for kids, adults, uh, and, and it was just a, to live. And to work out and uh, and uh, just be a sense of the Lakers community, golf course, whatever. And I would hope that the new owners would hopefully not just build two big, large apartment buildings, you know, and say call it good, but to take into consideration what has been there in the past because it's 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 something that's the staple of the Reno community and something that was really to be emphasized, to be important. So thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I just want to let the NAB members know that uh, there was public comment provided via email, and that was provided to you separately, and it will be part of the record. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Jennifer Alvarez, Community Liaison, for the record. I do have a correction to make to today's agenda. Uh, NAB member Pierce Donovan was inadvertently left out of the agenda, but he will be included on all future agendas. And excuse me, Madam Chair, I um, I just want to ask the NAB members if you could speak up a little bit. I know that our attendees through Zoom are having difficulty hearing, and since we have a full room as well, just to make sure everyone can hear us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Ward 2 NAB. Um, we've had sort of a, a little seismic shift. As of Friday, uh, our ward boundaries have changed. 
And so uh, there was redistricting and the date to take effect was when new numbers were sworn in that took place on Friday. And so the previous to now, the NAB boundaries went from Oana Lane down to Mount Rose Highway, you know, approximately, then on both sides of Virginia Street. Uh, covered initially around 60,000 people. We were redistricted, our, our ward used to start at Plumas Lane. And so when we were redistricted after the 2020 census, we moved south down to Moana Lane from Plum, and uh, we kept the same, uh, roughly the same uh, layout. We went to 50,000. Well, with adding a sixth ward instead of an at-large number, we created six wards. And so now each ward is around 40,000. So we went from 60 to 50 to 40. And again, it takes place, it took place essentially on Friday. Now our uh, boundaries go from approximately the Neal Road roundabout. Okay, you can visualize that near Ranchera. So north of Country Club Estates, or Country Club Estates. But um, it also includes the business park near there. Uh, it's Del Monte Lane, that area. And then north, all the way to the river. It's taking in a lot of what was Ward 1. So it's taking in Old Southwest, it's taking in Pollen Ranch, it's going all the way out to White Fur on the south side of the river, it takes in Idaho Park now. Uh, Virginia Lake Park is back in the ward, was out for two years, the redistricting, but it's back now. Um, and so again, it's around 40,000 people, and about half of those people are new to the ward. Um, some of the people on the NAV, I think, is anyone here from South Pino? I think I see you, one, two, three. And um, those people were invited to stay. They also have an option to apply to join Ward 6. They can stay as long as their term is, um, and even potentially further. And then we will also have some new opening for Ward 2. Okay, it's not Ward 1, it's Ward 2. Ward 1, sort of really big because it's down there on downtown Pino. And um, it still does touch up. Um, it's interesting when you're going north, um, there's a little bit of a dog. So we go north up to California Avenue. And as California Avenue goes down to uh, Keystone, that's where we meet the river. So we don't have the homes on the north side of California. So it's kind of an odd split. You have the homes on the south side of California, not, and there's a few homes in there uh, that we don't have. Um, so it's a very beautiful and interesting area. I'm looking forward to meeting the new members of Ward 2, uh, you know, wherever they live. I'm looking forward to being here. <laughs> um, I also wanted to um, mention with these boundary changes, of course, we, we said we'll be seeing some shifts on the NAB as well. Some people have already left and told us that they're going to try to join the Ward 6. And now Ward 6 is all South Reno. So uh, my previous ward, and so that goes about Mount Rose Highway up to, again, this meal roundabout, roughly. My understanding is Cyan did join uh, Ward 6, so previously it was part of Ward 3. Um, I have to check the map on that, but that's my understanding. It was always kind of an outlier, because Ward 3 went all the way down and intermingled with Ward 2, and now I can just go back. Um, so I just want to mention that um, Brandy Anderson is the new representative for Ward 6. So anybody hearing this or here in the room that's part of South Reno, that's your new representative. And um, she, I'll be happy to introduce her. We'll probably do some kind of meet group together for, for my new residents and also to say goodbye to the residents of Ward 6. Um, I am on the council for two more years. And uh, as always, when I was first elected, I was elected citywide. And I acted as if I'm representing all the residents of the city of Reno. That's just how we roll. Um, and that's the interest I take in things happening throughout the city. And I also that is the interest and focus of all the members of the city. Uh, special emphasis on the ward, but certainly a lot of interest um, in the rest of what's happening. Um, there's been a lot of activity um, in Ward 2. Um, we have some uh, new development we have on tonight, but there's been others as well. I encourage all the people here to stay involved. Um, and the people online, I know you said we have 17. So there's probably probably at least 45 uh, people in attendance today. And it's really good to stay connected 
I want to encourage you if you have interest to sign up to the Ward 2 newsletter. And it's really easy to sign up for any newsletter. You just go to the reno.gov page. You type in, in the search newsletters and it brings up about 20, 25 different newsletters. There's one for every NAB and board, but there's also ones on special interest projects such as Title 18 or horses or um, trees or uh, community development in general, all kinds of things. And I know when people have talked to me, they've gone and signed up for three or four or five newsletters, which I have. Um, I also want to mention I brought up some cookies. It's a holiday season. Um, they come from a new bakery that um, I believe is in War Two, and it's uh, the Dolce Bakery. Um, it's over by Mayberry and um, McCarran. So south side of the river, so it's still War Two. Um, and so I tasted some today. I so encourage NAB members and others to grab have a cookie. Um, that is it for now, unless you have questions. I know we have a lot on my schedule. Nap, any questions? I know you usually do ask me questions. And uh, seeing none, anybody in the audience, any questions? Okay, well, I'll be here. And uh, thank you for coming down. Thank you. Yes, I have basic staffing as my question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jennifer Alvarez, Community Liaison for the Record. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that the Reno Muni Port is having their annual winter coat drive until December 11th, and they are accepting adult-sized coats, gloves, scarves, hats, and blankets, if anyone would like to donate. And uh, the Reno Muni Port, downtown off of Sierra. And that's the drop-off. Yes, correct. Thank you. Yes. Our next Ward 2 NAB meeting is on December 17th. And those are my uh, updates, Madam Chair. And you will know, I uh, should have mentioned this, but um, Jennifer Alvarez is um, pin chitting. Um, our previous liaison, Tyler Shaw, is taking another job at the city. He's actually the guy responsible for sending out all the agendas now. Um, so the whole community liaison team is helping out with uh, different ones. I think Tyler was supporting three of us. So. Um, you're doing i know that you also uh supported me on a previous event today we opened a new business up at old town mall and that business is really interesting they're providing medical transport it's a um pilot program uh in anticipation for apparently medicare take having to be responsible for transporting patients to their doctor's appointments and hospitals but also grocery stores and that kind of thing uh, it's primarily for lower income people but I gave an example today at the at the ribbon cutting that my own father, uh, while he was a doctor, ran a, a prestigious institution here in Nevada at the Reno VA. Um, he also had some medical issues and ultimately he became blind. And um, it was very hard for him to get around and drive and he was totally re reliant on my stepmom. And that gets old. Anyone who's been a caretaker for anyone and that went on for about 10 years. Um, so he often tried to get transport elsewhere, and it was very, very difficult. Um, so I really applauded what they're trying to do, which is really get people to their appointments and other medical events. So um, that's something that just happened in our ward at Old Town Hall today. So Jennifer was there to assist. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Moving on to the development projects. B1 LDC 25 0016. We're moving into the development projects. We're going into B1 development project LDC 25 0016. Plymouth Street Development, former site of the Lakewood Tennis Clubs. A request has been made for a conditional use permit to allow for one a 273-unit multi-family apartment complex, and two, grading resulting in fields greater than 10 feet. The 9.48, the 9.48 acre project site includes three parcels and is located on the southeast corner of Puma Street and South Hills Boulevard. The site is located in Channel's Marshall Zoning District and has a master plan used as the designation of suburban mixed use. Looks like tonight we'll have with Andy Bearden from the Blooded Andy. Welcome into the Thank you very much. Is this side okay? It's awesome. And okay. I think we should move this mic. Move it over. 
Yeah. Yep. Move the cart back to make it I think so. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, hopefully I speak loud enough. Um, my name is Andy Derling. I'm with Wood Rogers. We're a local civil engineering firm. Uh, Garrett Gordon is also with me tonight um, from Lewis and Roca. Uh, we're representing the project developer uh, here to answer as many questions as we can for you tonight and take back your comment to our client um, uh, as it may pertain to the project. That's all. Whoa. I apologize for that. One second. I am not sure what happened there. Thank you. All right. Um, so this project is uh, we're, we're named is named the uh, Plumas Redevelopment. It's located on the southeast corner of McCarran Boulevard. Uh, on the map there, and Lewis Street, uh, Lakeside Drive is also on the east side and kind of bounds the east side. Uh, requested are two conditional use permits, as was mentioned uh, by the chair. Uh, one is to allow for uh, more than 100 units in the general commercial um, zone. Um, so we, with the request 273, obviously we need to um, apply for that conditional use permit. Also, we have fills uh, greater than 10 feet in height. So this site has about 30 feet of fall across it. And just in the grading of it um, results in, in fills greater than 10 feet in some areas. Thanks. Before you go on, um, our team, can you expand the slide to full screen? My system's not being the most okay. friendly. Uh, um, so this is just a look at the site in its current condition, uh, consists of three parcels, um, uh, and, and is the site of the former Lake Ridge Tennis Club. It was demolished in anticipation of, of a previously approved project uh, that's currently on the books, uh, in which we, we can kind of get into some of the details on what was previously approved and uh, what could be built right now. Uh, this is a new, new design that's been proposed by uh, a, a different developer. Next slide. Um, the site is Master Plan Suburban Mixed Use. Uh, this is just a little excerpt out of the city's master plan. It um, says provide, you know, suburban mixed use. The intent of that master plan designation is to provide opportunities for broader mix of uses in a more suburban context while also preserving opportunities for higher density infill and redevelopment. Uh, it also provides for opportunities for higher density housing within close proximity services and employment. Taking that a step further, um, our regional plan, our Truckee Meadows regional plan, also has um, um, in, um, uh, encouragements uh, for development, infill development like this, especially when it's in the McCarran Ring. So the McCarran Ring is kind of that area in our region that's been, been identified for more intense development, more higher density uh, residential development. Site zone general commercial. Uh, general commercial allows for a mix of different uses, um, typically, you know, kind of your, your typical general retail. Uh, and commercial uses, as well as uh, an array of higher density uh, residential uses. Yeah, a lot of people don't aren't used to reading these maps. Yeah. Can you point out where the project itself is? So it's highlighted in the blue um, on the screen. Um, so adjacent to it, we've got you know zoning districts of multifamily 30 units per acre across the street. Um, the special plan district below us uh, is a specific um, zoning category. Um, for usually for special things. In that case, um, it was part of that tennis club originally. That's a multifamily development as well. 
Um, across the street, um, kind of kitty corner, you've got additional MF30 land down here, MF21. So it's it's an area that has a lot of multifamily currently uh, in it. Um, so the Caramel Art is the east-west road on the top of the property there. Loomis is on the west side and Lakeside Drive is on the east side. Looking at the specifics of this request, uh, it's a 9.3 acre site, um, proposed 273 multifamily units in two buildings. Uh, the buildings are kind of centrally located in the middle of the site. Um, building one is the larger building um, uh, right on the west side here, uh, has a large uh, kind of courtyard area in the middle there that would be an amenity space, probably for the pool, um, pool type you know, um, amenity. Um, building one, we're calling it a split level. Um, technically, by code, it's a four-story building. Uh, it does have a basement level, which is on just this east side. So on the east side, if you were to envision this essentially row of uh, units on that east side, it's actually five stories tall. Um, so it's it's you know adjacent to the building two. By code definition, it's it's a four-story building. But we're trying to be trans transparent and kind of call it a four or five story split, um, just to kind of clarify that. Building two on the east side of the site is uh, 45 feet tall, four-story building. Uh, we do have an increased front setback in the GC General Commercial Zoning District. The minimum front setback is 10 feet from the street. Um, so from Plumas, McCarran would be a 10-foot setback is what's required. Uh, we have about 40 feet, uh, which is really taking into account the existing vegetation and burns that are on that um, on those, those frontages on McCarran and Plumas. The buildings themselves are set back quite a bit more than that. Um, they, they range from 80 to up to 140 feet, I believe, um, set back from McCarran and from uh, Plumas. Lakeside is kind of, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a panhandle um, shaped site. And so Lakeside on the other side really doesn't have buildings there. It's just kind of that really just existing parking that's there uh, that would be maintained for the project. Uh, there's 2.4 acres of landscape area. That's an acre more than what's required by uh, city of Cope. Uh, of that, uh, we're required to have 219 trees. If this were just a greenfield development, um, you know, nothing on it. So you have to, you know, you would be required to have 219 trees. We're providing 309 trees. Um, that consists of 155 existing trees, which again are located on really the Plumas and the Terran frontages there, and 154 new trees that would be provided. Uh, there's some on-site amenities, uh, as I mentioned kind of previously in the middle of building one, kind of that main amenity space on the south portion of a, a, a building one is an indoor amenity space, kind of your typical clubhouse type, you know, gym, that type of facility, and then the pool area likely in that courtyard in the middle of that building, and then a, a dog park on uh, the south side of, of the site there. Uh, there's ample parking that's been provided, 438 spaces provided. Uh, by code, we're required to have 305. Uh, the parking is all service parking, um, and there are a number of um, garages, about 71 spaces could be in these uh, little garage buildings. Uh, the yellow here uh, represent carports, and then um, the rest are just surface parking. Um, some of the um, things we heard from the last time that the, this, this, this project was approved was, you know, a lot of part on-street parking, especially on Plumas, uh, occurs, and there was a desire to see, you know, more parking on this site. Um, so we'll get to a comparison table at the end of this presentation, but just I wanted to highlight that, you know, there's there's a lot more parking that's being provided with this site design than, than previous design. Next slide. And before you go on, um, who is the developer? I don't know that you can. Um, so the de developer is uh, named Thompson Thrift. They're a national uh, uh, multifamily developer. Um, and so they, they're really keen on this site. They like to be in locations um, that are, uh, close to kind of, you know, community amenities, shopping, um, jobs, things like that. And so obviously being located on McCarran, that's a pretty uh, attractive site with, you know, kind of the shopping that's in the, you know, Fire Creek Crossing and things to the east um, and, and, you know, short short drives into downtown, things like that. And where are they located? Uh, they're all over the country. Uh, I think we're at, at Indiana is the group that we're working with. Next slide. Oh, I think, sorry, well, if I could, maybe if you want to take questions after. Um, 
so this is just kind of looking at the trees again. You know, that was another thing that was you know brought up as as wanting to maintain as many of those mature trees that are along the boundary of the site. Um, we did a, a really extensive tree survey a few years ago, updated it um, with this develop or with this proposal. Um, so there are uh, 155 trees remaining. 69 trees would be removed. Um, there are several that are that are dead right now uh, that would need to be removed. Um, they've had some issues with some beetles and different things, of, uh, you know, dis diseases as part of uh, those trees that are on there, but have been maintaining them uh, for the last several years. Next slide. This is a look at building one elevation, just to kind of give you a flavor of the architecture and also kind of to demonstrate that, that kind of four story, five story, that, that basement level. Um, but essentially, you know, um, to the south, sorry, the north elevation would be kind of the view looking directly from uh, McCarran Boulevard at the site. Uh, so essentially it's, it's a four story building, you know, 80% of it or more is a four story building. It's just that east side there that has kind of one corridor and one row of units um, that's on this basement level down here. And so essentially you've got, you, you have a slope that would go uh, adjacent to the building. And really that's just the slope of the parking lot. Um, so you would have you know, cars parked in there, carports, Things like that, so it, it's not. Um, you know, it's essentially it's a four story building. Just want to kind of make that clear. Next slide. Um, traffic um, wanted to you know provide you with you know more information on traffic. We did update the traffic study uh, from the one that was prepared um, a few years ago. Um, so new traffic counts, everything was conducted uh, and, and issued in October of this year. Um, the project's going to utilize the two existing driveways that are on the site, one on Plumas and one on Lakeside. Uh, there's an existing driveway on McCarran Boulevard. That will go away, so that will be removed as part of this, um, which ultimately aids in kind of traffic flow on McCarran. That's obviously the major thoroughfare. Um, existing intersection operations, so at Plumas and Lakeside, um, will have negligible impacts due to the proposed project. Um, the RTC has their regional transportation plan. It's currently the 2050 plan. They're going through a major update to that right now. Um, it's supposed to be adopted, I think, uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, as part of that, they're integrating a study that was done a couple of years ago um, for the entire McCarran Ring that looked at you know, transportation improvements around the entire McCarran Loop. Um, in particular, just wanted to point out kind of on this, this you know, little peachy color here, that's right next to the project. Um, that segment between Plumas and Lakeside um, is kind of that transition from two lanes to the west, and it's um, three lanes in each direction east of Lakeside. And so as a part of that transportation study, which was done a couple of year, years ago and incorporated then into the current regional transportation plan, it's to ultimately widen the Karen, uh, in a lane in each direction from Lakeside to Plumas. So, uh, actually, I think it's Lakeside up to Manzanita, ultimately. But um, that study identified that as kind of a short-term need. Um, and then really what we'll be doing is um, there's a gap in the sidewalk. There's no sidewalk on the south side of McCarran in front of the project. So we would be adding sidewalk uh, as part of this project. Next slide. So this is just one, again, you know, I know um, there was a previous project that's approved on this project or on this uh, parcel. Um, you know, that could be built right now, ultimately, uh, but they're, they're kind of amending it to go a different direction. Um, a lot of what is being amended are things that you know we heard the last time we went through this um, from the community of kind of concerns and a, a few of these highlighted here. Um, the type of housing, um, you know, as I mentioned previously, it's allowed to have higher density residential product or products in the um, general commercial zone. The current plan is condominiums, uh, which essentially are the same as um, apartments. It's just you could you know map them and sell them individually. You don't have to. You could you know rent them out the same way you would rent out apartments. But a um, little bit nuanced there. Uh, proposed now is just you know traditional market rate apartments. Um, the density in the general commercial zone, you're allowed to go up to 45 units per acre. That would be 419 units is the max density that would be allowed on this site. Uh, the current approval is for 314 units, which is about 34 units per acre. Um, this proposal is 273 units or 29 units per acre. The building height um, code allows us to go up to 65 feet or five stories. Um, the current approval um, had two different building types. They range from 40 to 50 feet. Um, both were four stories. Um, the current proposal um, building 
two is 45 feet, building one is 45 feet also, but on, on that one side would be 55 feet. Um, both are technically four stories, but again, that building one kind of has that five story element on one side of it. Um, the front setback, the minimum, as I mentioned earlier, 10 feet. Um, the current approved plan is um, uh, had a building setback at 40 feet from Plumas and McCarran. Um, really, the site design is that's where the quite the, the difference is. Where um, the previous plan had built eight buildings that were pushed out to the edges of the property. This is two buildings that are more in the center. Um, so we've maintained that 40 foot setback, but that's to the parking. Um, and then the buildings themselves range from 80 to 140 feet of setback from Plumas and McCarran. Uh, and then parking, uh, the current approval, of, you know, obviously we got to meet code. Uh, and then the current uh, required parking for the um, current plan that's approved is 325 stalls. It had 392 provided. Um, right now, you know, with the reduction in the number of units, obviously the, the amount of parking that's required comes down also, but the amount of parking we're providing is going up. So the ratio of the amount of parking to the number of units has really increased uh, quite substantially. We're required to have 289 stalls per code and we're providing 438. And with that, I think I have my required information on there for the folks at home. This is um, my contact information, Leah Picotti, uh, who's a staff planner, uh, both our email addresses if you have follow-up questions, uh, case number and project name. And then that uh, link is to, I believe, additional packet information of the submittal, which is on the city's website. Uh, we are scheduled to go to the Planning Commission on December 5th, that hearing date. Uh, or sorry, hearing time, they start at 6 p.m., uh, which is a Thursday night. Um, they're typically on Wednesday night, so just want to note that as well. With that, Garrett and I are here to answer any questions and take back comments to our clients. I have a question. Yeah. So um, you were really selling the, the fact that you have more parking than is required. To me, and probably a lot of people here are going to comment about the increase in traffic and I guess it's a shame we don't have a better mass transit system, you know, a bus system that actually works that somebody can use or, or you know, better uh, bike and pet facilities, but it is what it is. But um, to me, is there any way you could limit the parking so that we don't, I mean, I'm all for increasing the, the density in the urban core. It's just, I don't want to do it where you're having to add lanes on McCarran because you've added all these cars. Yeah. I keep saying it, if we build infrastructure for cars, we're gonna get more cars. We need to build infrastructure where people can move efficiently to where they don't have to have a car. Yeah. No, I think that's a great comment. Um, you know, when we do the traffic studies, the um, traffic generation is based on the number of units, not necessarily the number of parking spaces. So some of that, you know, they're gonna have, um, you know, surplus of parking spaces for guests and things like that that would be coming, you know, most likely kind of after hours, things like that, that really aren't um, during those peak, tra you know, traffic uh, times. Um, and one of the comments, the reason we kind of highlighted that is, is the last time we came through with the previous project, there was concern that there wasn't enough parking and um, there's a lot of parking that's used, it's actually on-street parking on Plumas, I don't think on Lakeside, but on Plumas, there's a lot of on-street parking. And there was concern that because that's already used now with the existing developments, that we would be exacerbating the use of that. So that's kind of why I highlight that aspect of the development. Uh, but, you know, to, to your point on traffic, absolutely. You know, we, we um, you know, my, my firm, we do a lot of multimodal transportation planning for in the region. Uh, it's definitely sensitive to that. But, you know, why I highlighted, you know, that addition of sidewalk adjacent to this um, and that, overall transportation project that I mentioned that was done a couple of years, years ago for the RTC that looked at not just moving traffic, but also multimodal trails, um, bike pet improvements uh, to your point. So that I know for RTC, uh, when they're doing these major projects, they look at, you know, incorporating multimodal improvements, bike and pet improvements with a lot of their, if not all of their projects. Thank you. Yeah. I think we should do that. I'm going to follow up on that a little bit. Okay, and let me just say, I've just got a note. They're still having a really hard time hearing. So you're really going to have to speak up, everyone. And next meeting, we'll hopefully we'll have more mics. I'll All try right. and repeat the questions because that's probably that would be yeah. really helpful. Yeah. I'm just going to follow up on that because um, Loomis is the major cycling route um, for north south across the city. Mm -hmm. And right now, with the on street parking there, because the apartment buildings don't have enough 
basements getting bored yeah <laughs> or being squeezed by traffic in the bike lanes is a real concern um, and i think anything that gets the cars off the street is a good thing um, it, it definitely needs to be over part over space than under space okay. and have more traffic to the curbs up on the street great. on Plumas especially great so maybe if i'll just repeat for the friends at home um what uh, member fisher was saying is um, there is a lot of on-street parking on Plumas, um, and in our, you know, to paraphrase, our proposal to have more parking on site helps to not exacerbate maybe more parking on Plumas that makes it safer for cyclists. Is that fair yeah. summary? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, what, what Can you say your name because they don't know who's speaking? Right. Okay. So this is Hal Taylor. I'm trying to speak loudly. Um, we had another project, and what a, as a general area of concern, the internal driving within the project, uh, that particular project had fairly narrow spaces. There was concern about traffic going in two directions. There was concern about emergency vehicles being in that area because they, you know, a fire engine is going to be wider than even the two cars. What kinds of considerations have you given? With regards to make sure we have, we have two ambulances, the fire truck, yeah. and four people moving, are we going to be able to move traffic around within yeah. the area? So the comment for again for the people at home, um, essentially is a question on on-site circulation. Are the the um, drive aisles wide enough to accommodate for emergency vehicles as well as um, two ways of you know two two ways of travel? Is that kind of right. get, exactly. would you mind scrolling up to the uh, the site plan? It's kind of, yes. I think, slide three or so. Um, so to answer, to be short answer, yes. Um, so with, one more. Um, so looking at the layout of the site, you know, with the two buildings internally, and essentially kind of a loop, if you will, uh, of an access way that goes around and through the middle. Um, all of those access ways, those drive aisles that are adjacent to the buildings here, so those main ones uh, have to be, I believe, 26 feet. The minimum requirement code for a parking lot is 24 feet in width, so it's a little bit wider, and so that is meant to accommodate for um, those fire trucks, especially that if they have to put out, you know, the booms and, and the ladder trucks and things like that. So, absolutely, it's designed, you know, designed to meet fire code, building code, zoning code. Well, and the concern is, okay, the fire truck is here, yeah, and there's people who need to get by it. For instance, maybe they need to get out because of fire. Yeah. I mean, so, is yeah. there enough there to deal with? Pastor traffic and versus the traffic, but they're more or less in the same place yeah. at the same time. So or you would have you would, you bet. No, you would definitely have, you know, for just normal passenger vehicles, absolutely enough room for them to pass, you know, in, in either direction, right? In a situation, if there were a fire, you know, emergency situation, you got a fire truck or an ambulance parked there. The other requirement that that fire code requires as of as of, of us uh, as designers is that there's two means in and out. So anywhere kind of you slice it, you'd have another way to get out of this site that if it were blocked, you'd have another route right. to get out. You said there are two entrances. Yep. So uh, this is utilizing the existing driveway on Plumas, uh, and then on the east side, utilizing the existing driveway on Lakeside. Right. Joe Summers for the record, uh, to pick up from the public transit, are there existing bus routes and are there going to be any changes to the bus routes or talk with uh, RTC about that? Yeah, so the question for uh, those on Zoom was about uh, bus service, transit service. Uh, is there currently transit service and, and would it be impacted essentially? Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. We can, we can definitely look into where the existing bus routes are. I want to say there was one on Lakeside. Um, it may be on the north side. Um, I need to look into where the existing routes are, um, but no, we haven't had that conversation with RTC. They are a commenting agency for, for this application. Um, I don't know that we've seen their comments quite yet, um, or I don't recall them, um, but I would say, you know, having kind of planned transportation in the past. Could be. 
Yeah, could be. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, when you have, you know, higher density development, that tends to attract transit, right? Because you would have more transit riders. But I'm not sure what RTC's plans are in the area. I see that looks like they have the perimeter the um, so the question was on the graphs on the perimeter. Um, that is said, yes. I mean, it's really there's existing turf grass out there now. Um, they may, you know, kind of zhuzh it up a little bit with some additional, you know, rock mulch and, and different things, you know, to, but uh, it's spray irrigation right now. Uh, and that would continue. Gray water? I don't believe that there is gray water in this area. Reclaimed. Reclaimed water, yeah. I don't believe there's any in this area available. Thank you. Um, uh, it's rather uh, kind of list of questions, so I don't know how you want me to. But... <laughs> it's not me, I'm making another question. Okay. Some questions. Can you please ask, answer the question? Thank you. Yep. Why is it that the land is not so lake ditch yeah we can handle that one first um so the question was about the lake ditch and how that will be handled um but yes it, it's tough to see here but the lake ditch essentially comes into the site here it's currently piped across the parent and then outlets on the on the north side um kind of goes by whole i think it's four of uh lake ridge golf course um so that We've we've designed accordingly, um, so you would have you know parking over the top of that. Essentially, it's a giant culvert that goes under the site. There's an easement for it, so we would we have to respect that. So the water would still continue. Yeah, that's a good yeah. So you know because it was a previously developed site, it, it essentially would mimic um, the storm discharge, uh, whether that's to existing uh, storm drain, which I think is in the Plumas McCarran area. Um, I, I don't know I, that I don't know. I apologize. Yeah. Okay, so we see that one. Um, <laughs> I have uh, questions about the dog park and its proximity to the residents on the south, mm -hmm. and why is it there, and what are you going to do to mitigate that problem for the people who live right next door to it? Sure. Um, so question about the dog park, its location and proximity to existing uh, residences. So we did look at that. Um, there are existing uh, large evergreen trees. There's kind of a big uh, row of large evergreen trees on the south side of the property, kind of right on the property line. Um, so those are being maintained. Um, additionally, there is there is a grade difference down here. So the, the dog park sits a little bit lower um, than the adjacent uh, development to the south. And then the, the Kind of hard because we cut off the picture here but to the south of us really there's two buildings and then there's a large open space area and a parking lot over here so we kind of felt like it was a, a pretty good location for that type of use oh, so okay um then um there on the southwest part on your very far southwest part of the map in the currently approved plans, that was considered to be shared parking of some sort. And there was an issue about the turnaround spaces and the shared parking and the rights and the turnaround for fire trucks. Um, that if, when they came in through that exit, yep. when they were to travel around that way, then the ones would require turnaround space. Yep. Yeah, so the southwest uh, quadrant there, this it, it's really an existing, it's an existing parking lot. Uh, so we're actually kind of leaving it alone. Uh, it will get regraded from about this location going north, uh, but there there are existing parking spaces kind of around the perimeter that are actually part of the project to the south. We're trying to kind of this actually I think improves on on what the previous plan had and sort of leaves that in the state that it is now. It, it obviously we have to we, you know repave the parking lot, we'll regrade some of it just to, to make the grades work, uh, but it it respects that existing part. Too, is that um, there was some number of uh, lots of parking spaces there. Are we including those in the parking space now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the yeah. image, you just said they belong yep. to a different property. Yep, so 
if you see what's in color here on our map, those spaces we've counted as part of ours. In the image, and it's probably, I know, I realize it's hard to see, right? But there are additional spaces that are around the perimeter of that that are part of the adjacent development and not counted in our parking. Yeah. Yep. So we tried to kind of leave, leave, leave it as is, if you will. And, uh, about design. Um, the currently approved plan, although it has more wording, actually has more um, compatibility architecturally with the surrounding areas, in my opinion. But okay. as you, I can't remember if you were on this in that way back, so if not, if you can't hear first, I don't know yeah. if you were involved with community committee, but that's a very big deal. So you need all the different validation plans. You know what you have is, I call them solemn buildings because they look just like every building in Moscow. <laughs> and there is yeah, like straight line, <laughs> except that that's a unique, yeah. uh, uh, not block facing as required by code because you have a little inset in the balcony or something. So they don't really count as a face wall, but those look like gargantuan flat walls, which the code is trying to avoid theoretically. Yeah. And although you do have some little ups and downs of a couple of feet, which I guess meets the articulation yep. standards on ICAM. Expressing discontent with the actual design compared to because the the prior plan for as many public hearings as they went through, the developers did try to accommodate people's feelings about neighborhood friendliness, adjacent properties. So when you go and look at those maps and say everything around there is an MF30 zone, they're actually two-story buildings that are more like MF14. They're none of them developed out to MF30. So to then put something that's effectively a five-story building on McCarran, you're outscaling everything. And if you're going to level the grade from the highest point over, those buildings are actually going to be quite a bit taller yeah. than, than we think they're going to be because the grade's going to raise. So when you're talking about, oh, we have a four-story building, but we have this depression, but you're, getting, you're proposing to fill that. Your four story building is actually going to be quite a bit taller than we think it is because we're not looking at the actual. Sure. Place, right? and, yeah, not necessarily. So oh, let me bring that back. Um, so the question was about the architecture. Um, yes, I mean, um, sorry, Johnny had a lot of questions in there. So let me try to pick them out. Um, you know, the um, articulation of the building, right? We are required by code to have both vertical. And horizontal articulation you know if you look along the roof line and then you know these colored elements there is kind of a pushing and pulling in and out no that's not, i mean yes that's kind of every building in reno for the last i don't know the articulation standards have been in place for 15 20 years and so this is i mean this i would say this is a pretty contemporary design um you know looking at the surrounding area you have some flat roofs, you have some pitched roofs. Um, so there is a variance in, you know, varying uh, roof types. The previous approval had eight buildings, like I think I mentioned earlier. Five of them, all, all of them were four story. Five of them were, um, had pitched roofs and three of the buildings were kind of bigger buildings like this. Um, not quite this big, but a little bit bigger about buildings like this. And they all had flat roofs. So, you know, there, there was similarity in that. Um, one of the things we heard last time was, you know, the, the buildings were pushed out to the edge. Um, and so, you know, a four-story building 40 feet from McCarran Boulevard is going to have a much um, more impact of massing than, uh, or, you know, in the southeast area, I remember at the planning commission, uh, one of the planning commissioners raised the question, you know, hey, there's two-story buildings next door. And, you know, you've got, I think we had 20 or 30 foot setback in that area and felt like that was not uh, appropriate. And so, you know, hearing kind of some of that stuff and we've passed that all along to this new developer and they've taken it to heart and tried to develop a project and sign a project that tries to address as many, much of that as possible. So that's why, you know, a lot of those buildings are pulled more internally more, you know, into the center. So much bigger setbacks to the existing. But the other thing that came up, of course, is that you're gonna lose the frontage when you can't get because that setback includes the right of way, which really the city's going to take when they widen the street. So it's a little bit of cost advertising. But what we would really want to know is how much of the setback after the city takes out 
Yeah, it'll still be a substantial setback. Um, we've looked at it and, you know, because on McCarran right now, there's that existing driveway that's going away. As part of that driveway, they have acceleration and deceleration lane. So there's already sort of extra lane um, width area in there, not obviously the whole frontage, but there is some existing sort of right of way real estate, if you will. And so that additional lane doesn't quite impact the site, like you're saying. Okay, good. Right. We have a testing on the screen. No, no, no. Um, yes, uh, Jennifer, could you bring up the photos that I sent, submitted or that afterwards? I took photo photos of the neighborhood around so that we could just not talk about the, the buildings that are next to. Is it okay now? Yeah. Madam, you can. Yeah. 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 Um, while she's bringing that up, because I think having the neighborhood that surrounds it, because not everyone is familiar with that, I took just photos so we could kind of look at that and discuss that. Um, I wonder, of your units, Andy, how many of those uh, 273 multifamily units are one-bedroom units versus multiple-bedroom units? Because that might infer the number of cars that are actually uh, made, made people that might live there with cars and bicycles, whatever they might use. That, 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 is taken to, that is taken into account. Let's just put proportion. So this is, I mean, this subject to change, you know, it's gonna obviously change the market conditions. Uh, so right now, as proposed, there are 12 studio units, 121 one bedroom units, 124 two bedroom units and 16 three bedroom units. So most of them are one or two bedroom units. And that's pretty consistent. We've done a lot of uh, multifamily development as a, as a company um, in and around Reno Sparks. And that's, you know, kind of a consistent mix. Are these deemed to be affordable housing? No, they've been, they're market rate. Okay. Now, market rate, those buildings I took a picture of. I understand those are apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. So is that the market rate that it's going to be? Well, for the buildings next door, in other words, will the new building so be market to those? I believe those are not affordable. Those are market rate also. Yes. So meaning they are charging rents for what they can bear within the market, not subsidized by uh, you know either tax credits or other things. Okay. And kind of tying back to Donna's statement about architectural integrity of the neighborhood. I mean, like I, I would say, I was on another project and this looks like it was just picked up and pasted and copied and shoved into that hole. It doesn't tie into any roof lines at all. Um, so could we go to the next slide please, Jennifer? Um, the hilltop is across the street just to orient everyone that doesn't know exactly everything. How, do you have an idea about that 45 foot height compared to Hilltop? Basically the massing of yeah, what I don't know across the street. So those people are homeowners. So those homeowners that are buying there will look across and see the block of four to five story building. Okay. And the next slide. Uh, that is on the um, south side of the development. I mean, Homey, lots of trees. So that's um, those folks will be living next to um, this block of buildings. And the next slide, yeah, and that those are directly across the street in the Karen, those um, uh, lower one-story golf, golfish um, homes. Um, very nice and lovely. So I was wondering. I know the city is very thorough. How how what's the feeling about when a block of units comes in to the middle of the community that doesn't feel like anything surrounding it. How does that? Um, well, you know what? Andy you know. is a planner, and I think a uh, uh, contextual neighborhood uh, is one of the a keystone of planning. But maybe you could address that. Sure. So I, you know, like I said, um, this is an area that's changing, right? I mean, a lot of what you've kind of pointed out, the apartments, 
um, uh, you know, the townhomes across the street were built in the 70s, 80s, yeah. right? Um, and so our region has changed in that time. Um, if you look at, you know, uh, apartment buildings and, and things that are built now versus, you know, what was built in the 70s, it's, it's very different. Um, so this is sort of a you know, evolution and maturation of the city of Reno. Um, and I think that's, you know, in the context of where this is located on McCarran Boulevard, the major arterial for our region, um, the area that our, our regional plan for 15 plus years, 20 years, several decades now, and said, hey, we really need to have um, higher density development inside the McCarran Ring, you know, on the McCarran Ring, inside the McCarran Ring. So when we take kind of that into context, yeah, I think it's absolutely appropriate to scale. Um, you mentioned you did a new traffic study. Yeah. Is that something that you can share with the public? It's actually, it's uh, that the link that's provided at the end, um, oh, traffic study is with that material, I believe. Yeah. If you can speak up, please. Go back to the site plan. I do have a question about the east driveway that yeah. fronts Lake, Lakeside Drive. Yeah. My question is because with that free right turn from McCarran, yes. if you're heading east on McCarran, you've got that free right turn and you're going on the Lakeside. That's a pretty quick turn. Yes. So that the traffic comes down pretty quickly. So currently, the, the residents now that exit out of the existing apartment complex, there's not that much volume. Um, and, and even before when it was the club, the tennis club, you can have the people that leave the club, it wasn't a volumeless amount of people. Right. So my question is, you know, how do they address like the, the that quick free right turn lane? And then when they come out of the apartment complex and they want to turn and either turn, get across and go right so they can continue on east down McCarran or they want to go on and go straight across the right side. That's a quick I mean, it's not that far. The radius isn't that far from the driveway to the deer sure. free right turn. So, I mean, is there any thought about how they're going to handle that? One more. There, it's not. It's That's fine. Not actually, the, yeah. And maybe if we can move well, I was thinking one that shows yeah. lakeside. Like, yeah, we need lakeside. Like, this can work. Yeah, actually, keep going up. Sorry. <laughs> There's a better one. Keep going. This one should be better. Um, um, so, Chair um, Strickler's comment is on the driveway at Lakeside. Um, and so, yes, that is, um, this is existing parking uh, that comes down. Um, there's existing parking, I think, right in here for the existing development. Um, so, this is a shared driveway with the adjacent development. Um, it's going to remain as is, right? Because it's an existing driveway. Uh, it is a little close to the intersection uh, with McCarran. Um, I think that's something that um, city staff was looking at with our traffic engineer. Um, we're kind of, you know, we're anticipating, you know, that is sort of the secondary access. Um, you know, it is a little bit more securitous to go out that way. We've tried to design it to where, you know, the bulk of the parking um, and access is really focused towards Loomis. Um, so that, you know, we kind of tried to do address that through site design. And is that a right out home on no. the lakeside? No, it's not. So, you know, I live only a few blocks from here and even tonight when I was turning out of Loomis to come here, um, I could not, um, there was at least a, a 10 car stack and I'm a very similar distance about um, half a block to uh, Moana, and I could not get out uh, there. It was it was all blocked in by people going straight or turning left onto Moana. It's the same exact layout as this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is a concern too, that you gotta think through, um, because unless it's a right out only, you're, and I'm only a couple people coming out my street. Yeah. This is a half of yeah. a couple hundred, maybe a lot of people. Well, a uh, 273, is that the number of apartments or the number of people? Apartments. And do you answer, was it like mostly one store, one bedroom or? It's mostly studio? one and two bedroom. One mostly and one, two. yeah, about 240 some odd, um, one and two bedrooms is the mix. And then there's a little bit of studios, a little bit of three bedrooms. Okay, so average number of people is two or one and a half or something? Yeah. So anyway, let's just say there's 300 people live there. 
uh, or 350. I, I think this is going to be a challenge, and maybe it would be good to figure this out. You know, yeah. we, we will definitely chat with our traffic engineer and the city folks. Yeah. Uh, Pierce Donovan, for the record, I'd like to make a suggestion for the developer, especially because, uh, I mean, all the material that we were given ahead of time talking, people specifically talking about congestion, I imagine congestion, and uh, even more questions about parking are about to come up during public comment, so I want to get just one step ahead of that. Um, this increase in parking stalls uh, with, a, with a similar, with a dissimilar decrease in units um, what this does, the prevailing incentive for, for reference, I'm a natural resource economist, so I think about incentives. Uh, in this particular case, having that many parking stalls, the prevailing incentive is simply to turn a lot of these, uh, about 120-ish two-car household, uh, two uh, bedroom units from one car households to two car households. You can control the average number of cars per unit if you want to by actually restricting uh, the number of parking stalls. And sure, the, there, there's a, a potential for parking to then spill out into Plumas. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, Patrick mentioned like the dooring issue is serious. I'm a big biker. I live on Plumas yeah. myself, actually, uh, but not on a part where there's actually a bike lane. Um, but in that particular case, that's, that's not your problem. That's the city's problem to curb uh, street parking rather than uh, you having to subsidize uh, basically street parking by adding extra stalls. My suggestion to make this a little bit more pragmatic would be working with RTC to get like a dedicated bus stop or a modified route so that you can induce demand onto transit for your residents and therefore lower the, um, I guess, the traffic pressure, the local traffic pressure that this project is absolutely going to create. Right. So the idea here is that induced demand doesn't just work with parking stalls and cars. It also works with transit. If you make it super easy for anyone in this development to hop on a bus and perhaps the rate is covered by like a group rate because it's baked into the rent or something like that, that's not all that important. If you make transit really easy for these people, you avoid a lot of the traffic related issues that people are bringing up here. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Any for the record? Um, I guess I want to second what Pierce, what Pierce just said. Uh, he summarized it <laughs> way better than I did. But um, yeah, it seems like you're kind of blowing off the whole transit thing. But I think, I mean, I would really encourage that. And then also my second comment is, uh, it is a shame that they're building so many buildings that look the exact same thing, mm -hmm. way you're building this. You know, they're they're on Audi, they're downtown, they're, you know, they're going up every place. and. It would be kind of cool to have architecture that is represented representative of the part of town that you know the historical area. You don't just I would encourage the developer don't just build the cheapest thing. You know, let's have a cool town. You know, that's my comment. I'd like to go to public comment now. Do we have any? Do you have comment cards that have been submitted? Only the the ones in the beginning. Um, comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the NAB's agenda. The NAB may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you are an attendee in Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. So people are bringing up their cards, and the people online, if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand. And while you're queuing that up, I'm going to ask Andy a question. Andy, I wanted to ask, um, you showed the layout of the buildings, but I couldn't tell. Are Do these buildings have internal hallways? Yes. So I have been working with a yes. lot of apartment complexes in Reno, some with internal hallways. And here's some of the challenges that I hope the developer will think about addressing. Okay. 
So one of the things is that a lot of times there's not a, a, a good enough light in the hallway. They're dark. And several developers, after I've visited with them, have actually gone and added in twice the light. So it's something, I know these two people build all over the country, it sounds like, but they haven't built in Reno. We do have an aging population. Um, lighting is in, in these hallways is important. Okay. Uh, number two, I'm interested in the elevators. Elevators have been a problem um, since I've been on council 10 years. What happens is um, they break, including in City Hall, okay? <laughs> Uh, they break, um, and sometimes we have power outages. And when we have power outages, particularly when we have four and five story buildings, um, that means that, especially if we have seniors, it's not senior living, but what we found is that seniors are tend to be drawn to these kind of layouts, either a condo or apartment, at least that's what I find. So one of the things, and maybe this is in their standard practice, is to install generators. I have an apartment in Reno right now, South Reno, that at our request is installing a generator for the elevator. So when and putting them on a separate circuit, so when the power goes out, there's adequate um, emergency lighting in those hallways, which are dark already, and there's a, enough uh, generator to get people. I've had people actually die when the power went out. The elevator didn't have separate power. They actually had a heart attack trying to deal with the stairs. So if they're used to living on a higher floor and counting on elevators, but there's suddenly no elevators, it's something to think about if they could look into that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, the other last thing I wanted to ask right now is when I was asked to uh, change the zoning on this project from uh, planning and development to general commercial, the rationale was a restaurant. That was the one rest rationale that was given to me. They wanted to put a restaurant on site. So is there any restaurant uh, for the residents or for the community? No. No. Know. So I'm just sharing it's it's disappointing because I leaned in to do what the developer asked. But what the result is is a much taller building than probably would have been allowed under the old zoning and more density, which I understand there's pro and cons of all that. But the actual rationale for changing it is not present. So something to think about. I don't know. So just to be aware. Okay. Questions from the public? We do have registered public comment this evening. Our first public commenter is via Zoom, Kim Bacchus. 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 And yeah. will you please okay. unmute, please? Thank yep. you. I think I did. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. And please state your Kim name Bacchus. for the record. Thank you. Kim Bacchus, B A C C H U S. Uh, been in this neighborhood for 40 years. I I have to take issue with the comment that, gee whiz, that 1970s architecture really doesn't amount to a hill of beans today. I would suggest that this cell block design that you are putting into this neighborhood is inappropriate for the neighborhood. Even the uh, even the businesses accommodated the appearance of ar the architecture of the neighborhood. I did not hear who the developer was um, because I can hardly hear anything that was going on tonight. I am curious to know uh, how many square feet are in the apartments. Are they tiny? Are they large? Um, what is the smallest amount of room? What is the one and two bedroom? And what is the anticipated rent for these buildings? Uh, you talk about the intersections where the traffic is horrific. You say that um, there's a 2050 project going on. How many years do you anticipate will go by before there is a third lane on South McCarran? Those of us who live here have been fighting the traffic issues for decades. Um, certainly would have preferred to have the Topols develop many, many years ago, much better two-story condominiums that they were going to do, but the city council turned them down because of traffic issues. The traffic issues certainly have not improved in that time. So my questions for you are, who is the developer? Is there 
opportunity to rethink that institutionalized cell block appearance of the buildings, how many square feet are in the apartments and what is the anticipated rent? And when do you anticipate the traffic to be improved by the state? As much as I can. Um, again, for the record, Andy Durling with Wood Rogers. Um, the, the developer is uh, named Thompson Thrift. Um, so they're uh, a nationwide um, home builder um, specializing in uh, multifamily like like this. Excuse um, me, could you the, spell the, the second name? Thrift, T-H-R-I-F-T. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then as far as the units go, um, they're, they're, I think I mentioned, um, you know, right now the mix and, you know, kind of subject to change, but a little bit um, because, it, you know, but 12 studio apartments, 121 one bedrooms, 124 two bedrooms, and 16 three bedrooms. I, I apologize, I don't have square footages on those, um, but that's the mix of bedrooms. And then I, I don't have any information on rent. That is, you know, really dependent. I mean, this is going to take, um, you know, some time to build. Um, these projects don't come out of the ground overnight. Um, and, you know, it could be the build time is probably 18, 24 months, I, I would assume at a minimum. Um, and so trying to project kind of two years from now what rents will be is difficult. So um, I, I don't have that information at this time. Thank you. Furthermore, I did hear you say that the current Lake Ridge apartments were not low income. I would beg to differ with you on that. Many of the units certainly are low income, and this unit that you are about to build definitely looks like a low income apartment building, not appropriate in this particular community, in my opinion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, public comment. Our next public comment is Bradley Carlson. And please state your name for the record. Can you come up, Bradley, yeah. here. Yeah. Do you think it's going off your computer? Or do you think it's... Yeah. yeah. Is that why they just can't hear? switched it. So hopefully... It should be good then. Yes. Okay. Can you pull up the site plan? How's the parking? It's resolution. And I just want to say, for those that don't know, I'm on another commission with Bradley. He's on the Historic Resources Commission. I think you're an architect. That's right. Bradley, so. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Um, we got four comments, and then I'll just let you respond. Please go through real quick. Okay, pretty quick. Uh, one is uh, on the drawing, I see a line across here. It looks like it, it, it shadows the curb line. Is that the right way of the current expansion, or what is that? No, that's, a, that's an existing parcel. Um, I don't know why they created okay. the fronted parcel like that, but that's just the parcel line. That's fine. So my, so my question I'm getting at is when the lane expansion happens mm -hmm. here, when that happens, how does that impact the parking and the trees? Um, so you can go through my question. Yeah, go for it. You can go, go ahead now. Yeah, go ahead. So that, that's, that's one. It's just the impact. It's, on, it's already been stated that this is going to be um, expanded. Which is got which I assume is going to impact parking, decrease parking, or change change the relationship of the buildings to the street. Um, the public access to public transportation has already been uh, brought up. I don't see it addressed in the plans anywhere. And, and I think that this building is going to be here for 50 years. It's going to be here longer than I'm going to be here. Right. This is going to define this part of Reno. It's, this part of Reno already has an image. It has a feeling. This is setting it in a new direction. You already said that you know it's changing. Of course, I mean life changes. Um, I would urge the designer to think about that and think about how this. Um, uh, Ms. Bacchus mentioned that it's very institutional um, factory feeling is what I felt. It feels very cookie cutter factory institutional. It doesn't feel like home. You're building people's homes here, um, and uh, it does to me also feel low income. There's nothing aspirational about it. Um, Growing up in Reno 20, 30 years ago, this was kind of an aspirational neighborhood. You know, I'd like to live on the golf course or in this area. This is a whole different direction. we will be here a long time. Um, one question, go, go to the plan that shows the parking. The courtyard, just curiosity, this, so this building, 
Uh, so what I'm saying is the building has internal corridors or some other some elevators and entrance and stuff around this courtyard. This looks a little a little close in here, but what is, what, what's the firefighting strategy for in here? It's just a question. Is is that uh, I assume it addresses, but if there's a fire in this unit here, how do we fight it? Um, so McCarran fire uh, contacts. Um, yeah, those are those are uh, the access to public transportation. Those are, transportation is going to be changing over the life of this building too. So hopefully we'll see improved RTC bus transit, bicycles, um, pedestrian. Um, anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Andy. I'll try to take a few of those. So, uh, you know, as far as the architecture, would you? Would you no, sorry, leave that there. Uh, architecture definitely packs along your your comments to the designers. I'm not an architect. <laughs> Um, and don't pretend to be one. Uh, and, and so, you know, some of your, your questions about firefighting, yeah, it absolutely meets fire code. Um, there are, I think, multiple points of access into the building for you know, fire access. Uh, I know the designers have worked through that with, with um, uh, real fire. And then, you know, you're, you know, kind of to echo your comments on transit, um, definitely, you know, that, you know, I think projects like this help to elevate the need for transit in these areas. Um, a lot of that's at our hands, right? I mean, RTC is a training provider. We can only kind of ask, right? Uh, and so we're definitely willing to do that on behalf of kind of the community. But ultimately, they're, they're the ones that decide the routes and things like that. Um, or for the other <laughs> uh, uh, I'll Karen right away. You answer it. Just, yeah. uh, that, that's pretty much it. Okay. Okay. So the buyer. Yeah, I, I answered. There are multiple points of ingress and egress to the building. Can you point fire. to the, where, where is the public in, in egress and ingress, and where where are the elevator cords? Uh, I don't I don't know. I mean, this is kind of that major amenity, um, you know, clubhouse rental facility. Um, I think this is kind of a bank of stairs and elevators. There, there's multiple points of access in the building as well. But again, so. Um, not the expert on that. So Andy, I think um, I heard, I think it was from the planner, the, the city, that um, this group, Thompson Thrift, has built identical buildings elsewhere, the same shape of building, same design. Yep. I think what I'm hearing, and I'm sure you are hearing, is that our community would like them to reconsider that and to uh, maybe get a design that might work not, I mean, a lot of people, while we have sort of the, some people call it prison chic, some people call it cell block, <laughs> you called it something else. But the, the request that I hear, not just here today, but elsewhere, is a rejection of that design model. So I think what you're hearing is people are asking for them to dig deeper and see about a different kind of design. That's what I'm hearing, but we haven't heard from all the people. Yeah. And I'm hearing that too from... Bradley as well. So, and let me just know we will take that back to Thompson Thrift and just a little bit more information on them, not just a couple of cookie cutter apartments around the country. They have off their, their main offices in Minneapolis, offices in Salt Lake, Arizona, Colorado. They've done 81 developments with over 21,000 units, 4.4 billion dollars in development costs. So, a lot of units around the country, I think I'm counting about 12 different cities. So, we'll definitely talk to them about this input, but They've, been, they've done a lot of these projects in a lot of different cities and a lot of different markets, and I think we'll certainly be um, willing to listen to what's being said here. Thanks, Terry Rupert. Oh, my chair here. We're going to want you to go near the mic. Near the mic. Okay. And we, we have approved, and I guess I'm asking for anyone on Zoom, uh, you can maybe raise your hand as the uh, sound improved. I have a very soft voice, so. I know, I'm just asking anyone on Zoom, like Stacy, um, you're on the team here. Um, can you hear any better? You can just raise your hand. Okay, I see Marianne has raised her hand. I don't know if that's to speak or. <laughs> okay, well, perhaps you could, I don't know, is the chat enabled? Marianne, will you let us know if you could hear better, please? Yes, it has improved greatly since the beginning of the meeting. Yes. Oh, That's thank, all you so okay, yes. thank you so much. Thank you. 
Yes, I'm Terry Rupert. I represent the complex across the street. I'm the vice president of the HOA for Lake Ridge Villas. It is a 127 unit condominium project that has been there for 40 plus years. Uh, we feel number one, it is a huge public safety issue. We already know how difficult it is to get out on Lakeside from the shopping center, from our complex, from the existing Lake Ridge apartments. It is a public safety issue. If there is an emergency and people have to exit that complex rapidly, they cannot get out on Lakeside if it's traffic time. Loomis is a little better, but not remarkably. Point number one. Point number two, we definitely feel that the architecture is incompatible to this neighborhood. You said that Reno is changing. There are very few vacant lots left in this particular area. And if you come in with something that looks completely different than the rest of the neighborhood, uh, I, to your point, reconsider the design. And then for our residents, we are also concerned not just about traffic, but noise pollution. I don't know if that has been thought of. Uh, if there's looking at any sound walls to protect uh, neighbors. And we all of us that live there are also concerned about our home values. Because when you put a project like this in that looks entirely different than the rest of the neighborhood, what does that do to our home values that live close by? And this is close by for all of the residents of Lake Ridge Villas. Thank you. And one more point on that. Um, when there was a proposal for townhomes and apartments on Mountain View over by Virginia Lake, and they worked extremely closely with the residents to come up with a design that was more compatible with the whole country club acres that's there. And and it got approved, and the residents came out and supported it. So it didn't start that way, but it finished in a different style. Thank you, Marianne Muriel. Good evening, I'm Marianne Muriel. I live about a mile and a half maybe south of this project. Um, I would like to reiterate that I don't think there can possibly be a left turn allowed out of this site onto Lakeside. And in fact, I would propose that they make it an emergency access only uh, for ingress and egress out to Lakeside. If they have to enlarge the Plumas entry to do so, that is a possibility. Everything's possible. We're only on paper right now. Um, I don't couldn't quite tell if there were sidewalks on all three peripheral streets. And I would like to reiterate that it needs mass transit uh, allowances. With those sidewalks, they need bus stops and shelters. Um, is it a gated community? I hadn't heard that mentioned yet. No. Okay. Um, I think it would be uh, to the environment's benefit if water runoff, the building roof, parking, drive aisles, et cetera, were put back into the ground for uh, to recharge the groundwater with detention basins. You have a very large, large landscape uh, portion on the northwest corner that I would think that could be accommodated with, as well as the dog park. Have it be an emergency flood area. Is the dog park open for public use or just private? Just Resident, okay, so I assume it's fenced and key fobbed or something. Uh, I I totally agree that it's a very monolithic architectural design with almost zero fenestration. Architecturally, it may as well be a tilt-up warehouse with some windows and a two-color scheme. Well, we've got a lot of those in Reno already, and I don't think we need one more, especially in this neighborhood. It's zero compatibility height-wise to the neighborhood, zero. You say this is a changing neighborhood, but this doesn't need to be the first mid-rise apartment complex in the neighborhood. The, and maybe technically, but it seems like this is on the outside of the McCarran ring. Um, and I do believe that Thompson Burke developer has probably built thousands of cooking counter units, not just a few. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Our next public comment is Steve Topol. Uh, 
And thanks for hearing me again. Um, can you put that photo on the head of the graph that shows the Darren? Uh, but this, um, have you have you guys checked to see? I we talked about expanding this uh, the roadways, handle all the traffic on on uh, uh, Karen, and make it from two to three lanes. I guess is what I understand. But when when we were doing these other projects, there was a big concern about having to take out all of these areas, these landscaping areas, and moving some of the uh, expansion of to make three lanes on that side going uh, going east and a lot of and losing a lot of that uh, landscape. Well I just wanted to mention this land had a deed restriction that required it remain open space and it was because it was land that we got Sam Jackson back in the day. There was no when we built Lake Ridge apartments there was no landscape dairy over there. Because Razorback, or I think it was Razorback Road or whatever came up from from down here was like a little two lane thing that went up here. And it was it was a nothing nothing burger. So was there it was hash lane. Hash lane, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I've been smoking too much hash. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, and then you point any of that. But Mr. Jackson was kind enough to give us this extra land up here. But as long as it remained, he wasn't selling it to us. He was giving it to us. As landscaping area, and, to, and there was a deed restriction that Bob Marshall and Dick Hort negotiated, myself negotiated, that would keep it that way in perpetuity. So that still exists, and and I would hope that the um, that the developer would take a look at that and see look look at that and see that still in, is in, in existence because that would prevent anything from being built on there other than even as landscaping. Thank you. Our next public commenter is Sandy Bankston. Hi, my name is Sandy Bankston. I yeah, you might want to go a little that way to get the light out of your face. There you go. Huh? Sandy Bankston. I just have a couple of things. One of the things that one of the differences between the prior project and this one, the prior project was condominiums. People were buying them. They were going to be their homes. They were going to live there. Aesthetically, it had to be pleasing. But they're not going to buy. This thing is apartments. It's transient. They don't care. They're, they're buying an apartment and they're going to be gone next year. So aesthetics is not nearly as important to the developer as it is to us. I have a couple of other comments. Um, public transportation, I think it's a wonderful thing but I think it's a, quite a ways off. I would like to know how many of the parking places are residential, how many are guests, and how many are service? How many are dedicated to the apartments <laughs> of that total? No, we, we don't break it down like that. It's just, they're all- well, But you have, what, apartments, and then you have guests, and you have service. and. It doesn't look like there's enough parking spaces to cover those needs. I would just say that the code requires 289 spaces, but and we have 438, so we feel pretty. I know you need code, but you me what's right. I mean, that I I see kind of a problem there. The other thing is when the last project was approved, they were supposed to keep the trees alive. That corner sat vacant for I don't know how long. The trees all died. Ugly, ugly. And I guess we what should have happened, I mean, should there be a time when the project has to be developed? What I'm concerned about is we have another ugly corner here for I don't know five years? Has it been five years? I don't I don't know, but I'm Probably. guessing five years four ago. years. Yeah. So anyway, I just think aesthetically, this this thing does not belong, and I think parking is a problem. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. And let me get this straight: you're not amending the old PD. You have a brand new project that you've submitted, right? And my understanding is it says um, that it's a it's a uh, CUP. 
conditional right. use permit. Right. But then I also heard there was another permit involved too from there, that they two combined. Different, two different conditions. Two different ones. What's the other one? For bills. Bills. Uh, I thought that Leah said that it was a two different ones, not just the CUP, but another one. Maybe they were consolidated. She said we can look at them together. Yes, for for the grading, it's technically a major site plan review. Major so site own, plan review. But because we have a conditional use permit, it just gets bundled. Okay. The they're, same, they're the same process. But I'm just speaking to um, Ms. Bankstrom, Ms. Bankstrom's point about having a permit approval go forever. I think that one's to be terminated, my understanding, and this one we replace it. No. No. This is a new application. So the prior approval still stands no matter what happens with this approval. And both will run parallel on their own respective deadline. Okay, well, I will just say, I think, I think the planners may have a different perspective, at least that I shared something different with me. So I might want to check in on that too. Permits expire after So PUDs, but that was a, not a PUD. There's no PUD. The last one was a use permit with a pen with map for the condominium. A CUP also. Yeah, correct, for the under 100, over 100 units and the pen with map for the condominium. This is, Use permit for the custom bills and the over 100 units. Mm -hmm. And both will have their respective deadlines. So they both, to the point, can't last forever in code. They will expire at some point. The attendant map goes for four years, I think. And then it can be renewed. Right. Twice, maybe. Maybe more. I don't know. Is that right? It can be. It can be. Uh, Extended once, extended once. Once. But you can also record maps to keep it going. The, the conditional use permits are typically 18 to 20 months. 18 to 20 months. Okay. Our next public commenter is James Carroll. Greetings. My name is James Carroll. I'm a resident of uh, Curdy Ranch and I work. Uh, just one block south in the, the shops of Bentley shops as a hearing specialist. And as was mentioned earlier, could we bring up the uh, image that shows the landscaping? I do want to echo again uh, Pierce's recommendation that if this is approved and built, I, I would recommend multiple pedestrian access points along the entire perimeter. That's not going to interfere with the landscaping deed requirement. That will significantly encourage those residents who would use public transit because it does make a difference if I have to walk from here along there or if I can just walk there. It makes a difference to a decision that someone's going to make about which apartment to rent, whether or not to rent that apartment. Additionally, I would recommend that you provide low cost, simple, but very effective and very important amenities for bicyclists. Consider please some sheltered bicycle uh, ports and don't just have them all clustered in one corner, but have them distributed throughout because that's going to attract and bring those residents who rely on bicycles. And wouldn't that be great to have a significant portion of these residents, again, if this is approved and if we all decide this is what's going to happen, to be bicycle commuters. I myself have put over 2,000 miles on, a, on two wheels over multiple years, and it's a wonderful way to live, and it's a wonderful way to live together. Um, I also want to draw attention to the civil way in which so many of us have conducted ourselves tonight. I'm very impressed with that, that especially when um, things are so close to our hearts and it can be difficult to um, engage and to have different viewpoints and to compromise on things that are perhaps expensive or have long-term consequences. And so I want to thank those who have been very polite in the way that we are working together on this. That's all I have. Thank you. Our next public commenter is Dennis Dolan. Uh, 
I excuse me, I just wrote down some notes here of things I wanted to share. Hopefully I'll be loud enough for everyone. Uh, the concern that the lady mentioned about the ugly vacant lot that we have there now is well-founded. However, it is temporary, likely to be temporary. But whatever is approved by the city of Reno, the planning commission, the other officials and built will likely be permanent for our lifetime. So I, I don't like the vacant lot either, but I'm even more concerned with what goes on that lot. The uh, traffic, if we have 300 to 400 apartments, figuring roughly, I'm not a traffic engineer, but at least two trips per apartment per day, I think would be a reasonable average. That's 700 cars going in, going out, using Lakeside, using Plumas, using McCarran. It's a lot of traffic. The uh, building height, everything around there with the exception of the new condos on that side of Plumas is two stories. We're talking four in one case because of the slope, five stories. I really believe that anything built there should be kept to two for aesthetic reasons, for numbers of residents, numbers of cars, traffic, all kinds of reasons. I think it should be kept to two. I know that's a huge economic impact on the developer, but I really believe that as for our neighborhood, that's important. The uh, aesthetics, the consideration for blending in with the rest of the neighborhood, I believe the two stories limit or something very close to that needs to be ex expected and approved. There will be an impact on schools. Will the elementary and the present middle schools be able to handle the increased numbers of students that would be living in those apartments, especially at the size of the complex as proposed now? Condominiums, this was mentioned by a previous person, Condominiums, to me, are much preferable to apartments. It's a more stable neighborhood, more stable dynamic, more commitment to the neighborhood. I understand that perhaps everything doesn't have to be fully condominium. I mean, fully condominiums, but even if a much greater percentage were condominiums, I think it would help our neighborhood to remain the neighborhood that it is. The uh, other thing is with condominiums, you do have options most often in building requirements that there might be restrictions in terms of renting. So that there would not be condominiums that would strictly be then in turn rented to other people but could stay with home ownership by the actual owner. And I'm concerned, I wanted to thank you members of the board and Naomi Doerr for what you do for the neighborhood. Uh, I have a lot of faith in that you will try to do the right thing, try to recommend the right thing. And we're very lucky to have Naomi Doerr in our board. I have a lot less confidence in some of the officials in Greater Reno in terms of doing the same things that are right for the lakeside area, unless we really push it and let them know how important those things are to us. Uh, I would like Reno to have its priority the betterment of Reno for those of us that live there now and be able to make sure that that betterment and improvement is something that is always kept in mind when new projects, new buildings, new traffic patterns are developed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public commenter is Luis Garcia Perez. Good afternoon, Luis Garcia. Uh, I have a bunch of questions and I'll try to bring them off real quick. Um, so as part of the chair's review to re-review the exit on Lake Ridge, can you guys also consider reviewing the impact of all that diverted traffic on the Plumas? Um, I mean, having bike route through the area, so I have a lot of concerns of just the added traffic over there. There's one lane on Plumas, and so if there is more traffic that way, obviously there's a safety consideration, but then also there's, because of where that exit is situated, um, could cause the people leaving that community to jump, basically traverse through the traffic, but the bike lane to turn right, it, rather than wait and on that one lane road. So just consider that as you guys are going through that. Uh, not sure if you guys had any uh, 
prior exodus consideration considerations in your concrete review. Sometimes we have to have houses abandoned. I don't know how that played into the traffic um, assessment. Both communities past Lake Ridge and Plumas um, light considerations. And so there's an existing light on the Plumas exit. Just wondering if you guys are considering to keep that there. It's super helpful to have stuff for bikes coming down late at night, or if you guys are planning on removing it. Um, I wasn't. I didn't see anything about signages for the development. If you guys are planning to do any light up signages, the built up at Lake Ridge Developers has a really bright sign. It's a little bit of an eyesore. Just curious what you guys were doing. Um, and I'll double down on the generation comment. Uh, this area is prone to. Uh, preventive energy energizations were tiered zones regulated by PCN. And so um, I think more so today than anything that impacts our community, we actually have a plan to outage tomorrow. So just if you guys can consider that, uh, that would be beneficial. Um, and if you guys are considering your redesigns I didn't see any drawing examples of what your parking structures look like. I think those are supposed to be integrated with the design. So the next iteration, uh, if we could just see those. Yeah. yeah, just a few of those. We we do have, yeah, in the complete package, um, there are elevations of the garages. They're all up. Andy, you may want to come near the mic. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so just to answer a couple of those. Yes, there are elevations for everything in the package that's on the slide. Just obviously giving you sort of a, a taste uh, of it tonight. Um, as far as getting your questions about Plumas, um, yeah, street lighting is kind of acquired at intersections. Um, you know, so those types of things, a lot of those are really uh, covered by code requirements that you know we have to be able to fill. And Mr. Press, did you say you work for Van Energy? I didn't, but I do. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you knew all the terms. Yeah. The owner is yeah. tiered. I mean, these are terms I'm familiar with. But I think you're right. I think it's just something happening in our community that MB Energy being a lot more proactive with, um, you know, outages before fires. So I lived in Florida for a while and they did it commonly. They would turn out the power maybe six to 12 hours before a hurricane would hit. And then unfortunately be many hours after a hurricane hit. We're doing that more here. Um, there've been two big fires near here. One was Collin Ranch fire, one was Pine Haven. <laughs> This would have been in the corridor that would have been de-energized, so a power outage. And this is why I'm, I'm being a stickler on this. I don't want any more people to die. I, I uh, And I think the code has actually changed now to maybe require it. I'm not 100% sure about the generators, but putting the elevators on separate circuits so that they can keep going when the rest of the building is turned off. So just thank you for that. It's, it's something I've run into quite a bit. Our next public commenter is Mark Johnson. Thanks, uh, Mark Johnson, for the record. Um, some of you might remember me. I was the Ward 2 Planning Commissioner for eight years prior to doing this. So thank you, Naomi. Yeah. Very familiar with the gentleman sitting over here. Saw this project the time that came before. Um, a lot of comments tonight were great. Um, I guess one of the things that I would throw out there, which was what I had talked about the first time it came through, and maybe some of you were reacting to, is that um, the neighborhood, regardless, you know, the, the way this project has been zoned, the way this site has been zoned, and the way that the city is moving forward, the master plan, this will be a dense development, and this will be a tall development. So I think the questions that were coming up and the reactions that we were having is that what is presented here is a dense, tall, single building. And I think one of the concerns that I raised originally, and I'll raise it again, is that if there are multiple buildings on this site, even if they are taller and even if they are larger, that is what the neighborhood is. This is not going to be a two-story set of apartments because the city has already dictated in their master plan that that is what they want. So if you look at the neighborhood, yes, it is two-story buildings, but it is two-story groups of buildings that make up an assemblage of those developments. And so the recommendation that I have as a comment is not to be opposed to the development of this project, but to look at this as 
a series of buildings rather than the larger buildings. Because I think then, you know, there's architectural comments one way or the other. I can speak to the architecture because like Bradley, I am an architect. I don't want to do that because every architect has their own opinion and they always disagree. So I will say that, you know, the architecture is going to be more modern than what is there. The architecture is going to be more like what we see elsewhere in the community because that is what is being built right now. So I'm not, you know, disagreeing with what you guys are saying because when you see that in a lot long wall, it is far more difficult to, you know, wrap your head around than if it's in smaller buildings. So I think in terms of the reaction that I would have, it was just the scale of the building in its horizontality, not its vertical thing. And then to Naomi's question about uh, the code, um, when you hit that 55 foot threshold, and, and you're probably familiar with this, you get because the city of, or the state of Nevada has a different high rise requirement than everywhere else because of the MGM fire. Um, a lot of things kick in when you hit that 55 foot elevation. So the point about a generator for elevators may be a code requirement that gets addressed regardless. So yeah. uh, just something to think about. So anyway, thanks for your time. Thanks for everybody's comments. And Thank you. Our next public commenter is Bradley Carlson. Thanks again, uh, Bradley Carlson. Real quick question. Um, apartments, condos, this has been something words have been thrown out here and they mean different things to different people. And the question is to clarify what's, what it is. And are we um, owner, are, is the goal initially the owner occupied or rental? And what I'm seeing in some developments, I owned a condo in Illinois and I started becoming aware that a lot of developers were taking a strategy of building a building to initially be apartments for say 10 years. And then once the statute of limitations expires, converted to condo. And that seems to be a good strategy from the developer side because it limits their liability and all of the issues that come up. Uh, condos are inherently Immediately, immediately hit with a lot of uh, issues and suits and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, my, my question is, what, what is the strategy as a developer? Is it rental, owner-occupied condos, apartments? Proposal here tonight was just apartments, rental, rental, rental apartments. apartments. Okay. With the possibility of being condos in the future, or that you have to be determined? Not at this time. You would have to go through a tentative map, which is the whole other process. Right. Okay. Come back through this process. Yeah. Right. Thank okay. you. That's not right. And I wanted to bring that up in people in the room, too, because I hear people use the word condo and apartment interchangeably. And condo is a legal term, and apartment code wise is just a long. Thank you. Thanks. So I just want to share that I, I have a lot of apartments in Ward 2, and they're not all built this way. Um, example is there's some apartments going up Wedge Parkway that have pitched roofs, for example. Uh, there's the Alexander Apartments right on Virginia Street, which are built. Um, and one thing to think about them, they're, they're only, I think, three or four story, maybe three story, but the massive, the massiveness is not there. They're done in smaller units. And what it tends to do, especially when you have internal hallways, is create more community. So you have a smaller building, you have internal hallways, so the people see each other versus external, they don't see each other as much. And it just seems to create um, community. So it's when they're looking at the design and some other things to think about. So that there are current buildings being built that are not this style today. Okay, so just some things. More speakers? We do not have any additional uh, commenter or public commenters at this time. Our next item on the agenda is item well, C. Well, well let's, thank you. Before we go there, let's talk about what happens with these comments. Okay. So the NAB members are going to write their own comments based on what they heard tonight and their own perspective. They will submit those in. I understand this is going to planning commission. You said December 5th. Okay. December 5th is very quick. It's right after Thanksgiving. So, um, what I would suggest is if you feel strongly about something you've said here tonight, you should put that in writing and an email. Uh, I always recommend sending it to the whole council as well as to the public comment. So there's a link called public comment at reno.gov. 
but often those don't get to us until the last day. And so we don't have the benefit. Even if you send it in a week ahead, we don't get it till the day ahead. And it's a little hard to process everything in 24 hours, okay? And they also, they cut off comments um, for, for the planning commission as well, I think at four o'clock the day before. I'm sorry, I was I had my wrong yeah. thoughts on. So next step is planning commission. So would you just walk us through that, Mark, since you served there for eight years? Um, yeah, so the, the NAB comments are very important. For the, for the, when this project comes before planning commission, it comes with a very similar package to what you receive with even more information about all the findings that have to be made. And it is accompanied by all of the comments that came from the NAB, both public comments that were brought up and written comments from the NAB. Uh, so those are all part of the information that the planning commission gets when they're looking at this project. And then to Naomi's point, uh, the planning commission has a separate contact through the, the city of Reno uh, website that goes to each one of the planning commissioners. And that correspondence, not only does it come through as the package, you know, as they said, the project is out there, but it also becomes part of the package. So any information you want us to see, anything you think about in addition to what you heard tonight or other thoughts that you have, uh, send those through uh, the planning commission. Obviously, going to be taking a very hard look at the traffic issues, uh, the access issues, uh, and a lot of the comments that we're going to be served tonight. Uh, so, emphasizing those as part of what you're doing as part of the process. So, the beneficiary of your comments tonight are the applicant's representatives back to the applicant, the owner. And it's also for the planner. The planner in this case, her name is Leah Picotti. Um, and I think it's in your information on their packet. Is that right? So Leah has to process what you've said. And then she has to have a communication with the developer about, well, what do you think about what they said about the entrance, of, you know, the exit out of the building on the lake side, that kind of thing. What do you think about the style? So that's the main uh, beneficiary of the comments tonight. If you write any comments, those will go to the planning. And they are the ones who have to make the decision. So I'm just saying, you have one audience here today. You can also go to the Planning Commission, just like you come here today. You can, I believe, zoom into the Planning Commission. Is that right? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's correct. So you can also, for those that we had about 20 people that uh, or more that zoomed in here tonight, uh, you can zoom in there as well. So um, just just all the ways to communicate, I just wanted to be clear about what happens with your comments today, but the fact the planning commission is not here to hear what you've said. Okay, so you have to communicate with them in a different way. Are petitions helpful? Um, I generally don't support petitions because um, they generally, either a petition has a list of names and I also often wonder, people know what they signed. And number two, um, sending in repetitive letters that have the exact same comment are not particularly helpful either. I would much rather get 10 comments with individualized comments than 40 with a uh, replicated exact same comment. I mean, me personally, on council. And I have to feel that probably the planning commissioners are the same. So Naomi, we send to the planning commission and to the council. So I, I made a misstatement. This is not going to city council, it's going to planning commission. So they're your audience. Uh, their, their main uh, one is uh, you'd send it to planning commission at reno.com and they distribute it to all the planning commissioners. Okay. It would only come to council if for some reason it got appealed, which is what happened last week. So we, we city council won't have a role here. It's the planning commission. So anyone else on this procedural stuff? Yeah. One, two, cutting talent She is the reviewer, and that is another good person. She would she yeah. has to write a staff report that goes to the planning commission. She would give it to the planning to the planning commission. No. Yes. Is that a yes? Any any correspondence received by the planner on the project will be forwarded to the planning commission. Thank you. Would you spell her name and say that? Picotti L at Reno back up, but Picotti is spelled if you have it. Yes. If I can oh you have it. I took a picture of Why don't you just 
Say yes, uh, Pukati is spelled P I C C O T T I L. Okay, Pukati L Arena dot com. It's a P I C C O and then you can hear the last part. T T I I then the L for Leah. Okay. So that's a very good place to send your comments. She has to make a recommendation. She has to work with the developers. She has to, um, working with the team and planning, come up with what they think is the right answer. And they have to then recommend it to the planning commission who get to ask their own question and maybe very informed by what you say. What Leah thinks about, let's say the entrance of using Mimi's comment, the exit out of uh, the thing, and she may say, you know, I think it'll be fun. But you go there and you tell uh, seven planning commissioners your issue, and they may say, we don't think it'll be fun. So they may have a different point of view. Any other comments? I, I'm just very grateful that you all came out to participate and those online. Um, it's extremely helpful to the developer to get the best product is to be representative of the community. And it's very helpful for the planning commissioners to make a good decision. Okay, they need to hear from you. Uh, maybe one lives in this neighborhood somewhere nearby. Maybe one, okay? But once the planning commission meet, then it goes to city. No, so it will not go to city council. Um, like I said, um, the decision is final by the planning commission. If someone chooses to appeal that decision, doesn't like the decision, they can appeal that to city council. And then there would be a hearing in the evening and city council would be the same process that the planning commission did. People would show up, they would express their opinions, city council may agree with the planning commission, may have a different perspective, but it doesn't automatically go to city council. Would that override the planning yes. commission? That, that's an appeal process, just like in court, which overrides the lower court's decision. So something that could happen in that process, and even at planning commission, saying at the council, is that let's say the staff comes up, and I keep picking on this lane, but it's an easy example, and they say um, it's fine, fine as it is. But the planning commission may say, you know what, we're concerned about, it. we want it right out only. We don't want people to be able to take a left turn across traffic at such a short distance to light. So they could write their own condition. Am I speaking correctly? You Mark, I mean, you've lived there for eight years. So you could add your own condition. There, yes, as a part of, as a part of the approval process, the planning commission does have the ability to add to the which, is always part of the discussion. It's not something we're saying to that. And it usually has to be uh, acceptable to the staff. And okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes. I wanted to for Andy and Gina. I just wanted to say, from my perspective, it's not more than time. In this case, we lost under 220 people speaking at these meetings. And the takeaway that um, one of the takeaways I would really appreciate it if you would tell your client is we're not saying don't build. Okay? We're, our, the thing you asked was build smarter, make it compatible. Most of the resistance that happened on the times, like things that you've heard, at least I understand, I think many people just wouldn't understand what the zoning is and what that means. But the interest is in neighborhood compatibility, and like Mark explained, the multiple buildings versus the massing, at least Netherlands, that are really inappropriate to name. But I don't know if you're if the person you're working for wants to take that into account, but I think the neighbors would really appreciate it because we like these people I've been spoken to about this, we really like to be able to get behind the project and feel good about it and feel like there's some pedestrian amenities and the cohesiveness in the neighborhood, that's the kind of neighborhood we have. This, the first night, really doesn't do it. And I really don't want to go through all those meetings again. <laughs> so, it was a lot. It was the a meetings lot. went late. Almost really? late. Many times. No. So, you had a question, sir? What's the relationship with the, with the planning commission as conditions in terms of modifications to the road? 
how does that get implemented in terms of cost? So the right. versus the city. So there's that? pretty much two ways. So the question's about how to, if there was to be a change to the roads, what who handles that and how? Uh, basically, developers pay an impact fee, uh, two impact fees. One goes for recreation. So on an apartment, it would be $750 a door, would go into an account, and that account can, is called a residential construction tax, can only be used for new things at parks. Can't be used to maintain parks, can't be used to repair an old bench, has to be new. It's, it's a really a phony contention as a city. We would like to be able to, A, have a higher number, uh, homes pay $1,000, and we'd like it to be able to use for a wide range of things. And there have been bills at the legislature over the years, being that we are Dylan's rule, we're not home rule, we can't set our own rules. We have to get the legislature to agree to our rules. And and uh, this number of $1,000 door to 750, I think goes back to the 90s, hasn't been raised. It's in state law. Okay, the second thing, the second impact fee you pay, and I don't know what it is here, but in South Reno, they pay a little over $5,000 per door, and it goes to RTC to do road improvement. Uh, if you're south of I-80, it has to be used on road improvements south of I-80. And if your project's north of I-80, it has to be used on a project north of I-80. Uh, it does not have to be used at the point of inflection or the point of problem. Now, there is one other thing that can happen seen it many times. Uh, if there is a particular problem that is being caused by a project, that money can be directed with an agreement with RTC to build a specific thing, a roundabout, a particular light that is problematic with a project. So used right there, the developer would build it and they would get an in lieu credit of their impact fees. It all has to be worked out ahead of time. The challenge here, is McCarran is an NDOT road. So McCarran's not an RTC road. And so all bets are off. Don't know how it works. I recall, and maybe you recall, Andy, when this project last came up, there was discussion about at, uh, having a lengthened turning lane onto, I want to say, Loomis. And I think that was built. Yeah. And was that built by NDOT? Okay, but you guys did not pay into that. That was already contemplated, I think, because you know stacking was happening on McCarran and people weren't able to turn on Plumas. The light would back up people, 20 cars. So they, they, they lengthened the stacking unit and they also might've changed the timing on the light. But this is gonna be a little bit complex because again, it's NDOT, Nevada Department of Transportation, not RTC. And just to give you an example, of how things don't go so well sometimes. We had a bunch of storms back uh, two years ago, not last winter, which was pretty bad, but the winter before. So it would have been 2022. You may remember we had storm after storm, lots of plowing issues. The state of Nevada is responsible for plowing the Cairn. The state of Nevada is responsible for plowing I-80. A lot of people thought it was City Reno. But we don't have, it's not our job, not our responsibility, not our trucks, they have bigger trucks, et cetera. So there was a lot of challenges there about those roads not necessarily getting the attention that they needed. And a lot of people thinking, oh, that's a Reno problem or whatever. But anyway, you can see the complications with these ownership issues. So I don't know, do you happen to know, Andy, with a NDOT versus RTC road, how these are handled? Um, a few different ways, but RTC can, fund improvements on and not right of ways. And a lot of times, if you look through the regional transportation plan, there are a number of, you know, because it's, it's an arterial, right? It, it's a arterial street, which, you know, is a regional road. So there are opportunities for RTC funds. Yeah. Okay. I can answer your question. Yes. Um, so if you have to get a right-of-way occupancy permit, you have to go through the permit process and you know the RTC can apply for one, and it goes through a whole design review where they check standards and you know check you know whether whether something's applicable or not. But it's the same process; it's just going through a different state agency. Yeah, it's out of the district. I just don't know if they do those agreements like they um, they're called RIF, I think, uh, 
road impact fee. That's the fee itself, regional okay. road impact fee. And then but then the agreement. Offsetting agreements. Called. Offsetting agreements. So if if uh, the city decided, the engineers and planning said, you know, this should be addressed now with the development right now, they might come up with some improvements that they think make this project work. And they would then look at you, the developer and RTC, and say, we would like to see this addressed now. And we did this uh, recently, Matter Academy. We said they need a light. We said, in that case, whether or not it's approved for a road impact fee agreement. Um, but I, they're going to work together and try to make it so. So, we have to be on by 8.30. Not 8.30. Oh, it's interesting. With that, I would thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for your comments tonight. Um, we do need to move this meeting along as we only have so much time in the room. Uh, if anybody has, like I said, please provide your comments to the planner and also um, and submit your comments on the for the project. They're very important. I'd like to move on to item number C, Board of Commission Committee Member Reports and Announcements. Does anybody have anything to report? Any announcements from the board? Very good. Okay. We're going to go into feature agenda items. Does anybody of the board members have any feature agenda items they'd like to place? Yes, Dave. I can Dave, that's up for the record. Um, you know, you know, we hear you, and, and maybe it's not a feature agenda item, maybe you can just answer it. But I guess my question is, you know, there's the city does have a lot of infrastructure, you know, parks, sewer, you know, whatever things to maintain. Is there a budget document that you can point me to that says, okay, you know, they, these infrastructure items are going to last so long, so we should be, you know, putting money into an account and yeah. then you have to fix them as they go. Right. Um, is there an overarching document yeah. that looks at the infrastructure and yeah. and when it's going to expire and then the uh, associated yeah. budget to? Uh, yeah. So there's something called the budget and brief, and there's the more expanded, um, this is the bigger document called the, we, we produce them at every government agency. They're pretty thick binders of every project. What's that? It's the C, it's not the CIP, but it's the actual document that incorporates all the CIPs. Anyway, we have one of those um, and we have different CIP budgets. So for sewer, for roads, for parks, okay. Um, they're quite limited because the city of Reno, I think we've gone over this, um, does not does not have a lot of money, bottom line. I mean, because of a couple of reasons. One is something called C tax, which is a consolidated tax, which is which we only get about 25% of. Even if the residents that pay in, most of it goes to the county for bigger things like libraries and social services, senior services, et cetera. Um, and then there's property taxes, which also has its challenge with depreciation, which means that the value of houses are going down every year until they're fully depreciated. Um, so anyway, we create a CIP every year of what projects are gonna do. We have circulating road projects that move around every ward different every year. I think they pick two wards. So we have like a two or three year return frequency in some part of our ward. Just to mention one nearby Virginia Lake, a lot of the roads in the country club acres uh, got updated got completely resealed, new sidewalks, everything. Um, that happens very rarely, but they, they move from section of town to section of town. They put everything, they use something called a pavement index. So anyway, um, you know, check in with me later and we can get you any budget document you want. But are you asking for a future agenda item that would go over it? Well, um, I guess, yes, I would like to know, you know, if we're in the red by how much, um, you know, just a, a gotcha. that spells that out because what the needs are. Yeah, what the needs are, and yeah. I think it would be better. So you think you have like a critical needs like presentation? Yeah, I I love it actually. It make you much smarter. Um, you will find that like in stormwater, we don't have a stormwater utility, and we're like fifty years behind. On the other hand, you'll find our sewers pretty up to date because we can't afford to not you know to be leaking out sewer water. You'll find our sidewalks are behind. To find our street patching is pretty good, even though people talk about it all the time, right? Potholes and stuff. It's pretty up to date. Um, so everything's you'll find our parks are on the bottom of the list, very poorly maintained. 
So it's it's all over the board, but I think it's a great idea. So let's request that. Thank you. You've touched on parks. Thank you. Um, you have a new person that was gonna that came in to raise money for parks. Yes, Landon Miller. Yeah, could we ask him to come and talk about cool how, yes. how he's doing in yeah. his new position and what success? Uh, yeah, no. it's a well, brand new position for the city um, is to go out and look for grant funding and other funding because we are so poorly sourced, resourced yes. for our parks. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, I'm sorry, I just get on. All the way. But you know, part of the problem that we have, right? first of all, that we have neighborhood advisory groups is really important. Why? Because when people say, I live here, this is what I see, this is what I feel, this is what we had 20 years ago, and I like this. I mean, that you can only get on a neighborhood space by having people come here and talk about that. And that's not a thing that you can do in a large city. You can have a citywide meeting and Right. No, you, you, you don't never, get the detail. I'll never get that. But but uh, but there are, there are interesting questions, and it's perhaps well. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, here's the question: the buzzing one. Why are we having this discussion tonight? Two reasons. One, a lot of us looked here while the tennis club was still here, and we feel like here. Okay, that's part. We feel a loss in a sense. From that, and how are we going to replace that with what's left? Especially since they've left that thing just sitting there for you know far too. The other thing is, so much has happened in the city in the last few years because what's happened in the industrial park? That's what really drove them. First of all, let me say, by the way, to leadership past present of the city, the fact that we did not become Las Vegas. We did not simply become gaming, that we did warehousing and other things to diversify the city. They should get tremendous credit for that. Uh, it's really we could do some of the things we can do now that that we couldn't because we'd already have another casino built there. But for instance, part of the other part of the distractions, I think, is we're driving around and all of a sudden we've got all these apartments. Right. Now, if we were a large city, or we still in Chicago or something like, like that, it wouldn't be city. But all of a sudden, it's like, what are all these buildings coming from? And are we building them? Do we need this many? Well, let me, uh, since we're in shortage of time, let me propose two ideas that might be interesting sure. for the NAP. One is a city, and I've had two training sessions with our internal economists, who could talk to you a little bit about how our demographics are changing, what is changing in Reno? What's changing in our industry? What's changing in our residents? Are residents getting older, younger? Are, are they, you know, the diversification? I think it'd be great education for the NAB to get a talk like that. The second one is on the planning side. Um, the fact that buildings show up out of nowhere it bothers me too, because I usually don't know about them either. And the reason I don't is because there's no requirement that building permits. A lot of these things, all they need is a building permit. Uh, and they can get built. They don't need to go through this entitlement process, which is what we're discussing here today. And so uh, uh, it, it really means half the development we don't even know about or have any opinion about or have any input on. So, I mean- We don't know whether it's needed or it's too much. Or if it's filled. Whatever. Is yeah. that so, something that the city can change? What's that? Is that something that we can- It is. And I've yeah. asked for 10 years that somehow, how can even council members get put on notice about these building permits yeah. that are issued? And then there's a third thing, and it affects this right here, this project we were talking about tonight. And that is that there's a separation between clearing and grading permits and entitlement permits. So you can get a permit to clear and grade months to years before your project is ever approved. And what if your project is never approved and I've gone in and cut down all the trees, prepared your site, and that thing never came to fruition. Now you just have a clear. And I, where I used to work, we didn't do that. You couldn't get a clearing and grading until you actually had some kind of entitlement. And I actually think those should be linked again, but you know, it's one council member, but I mean, it's another dynamic that yeah. plays in here. That is why we have a demoed tennis club a cleared site that didn't need to somehow stabilize all the dirt. They were required to water the trees, but clearly some trees died. And I don't believe it was disease. It's the classic. The trees right. died because they were diseased. 
Now, typically trees die because they aren't water in Reno, Nevada. Right. So anyway, I think there's room for a couple different agenda items here. Thank you, Hal. Very interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. the perfect, perfect example of what you just brought up is the Red Chair Equestrian Center, which was demolished. Correct. There's no plan there. They have to come back and amend their plan. Nothing. Get an entitlement. No. Yeah. And there's no um, guarantee they are going to get that entitlement. That's correct. Right. So they cleared it to do. Yes. Um, I have one more question. Um, it can either be an agenda item or just something you answer. Uh, why has Jacobs not submitted their master plan yet? And what's the house? Oh, well, I've that? seen that in Alicia Barber's. Um, right. I read that. I read yeah. That. Well, of interest, if you're interested tomorrow, they are, uh, in fact, same people are making a presentation on their one year um, report on the Reno, on the Jacobs Glow Plaza tomorrow at City Council. City Council meeting is quite short, so it's not like an all day event. It should be pretty early on the agenda. So if you're interested, they have to submit a report and go over it with Council. I'm sure it'll be a question that's asked. Okay. Right. Thank you, everyone. Is there any public comment? Any public comment on Zoom? I tried to make as public as I could. <laughs> yeah. We have none. All right. No public comment. All right. Anybody would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? All. Second. All for favor. Say aye. Aye. Good work today, you guys. It was, it was a good job. Good comments. Thank you.